Father, we sure thank you for your great love towards us. You who were rich in mercy, great in grace with the love with which you've loved us. That love that loved us while we were yet sinners. That love that first loved us so we can turn around and love you. Showed us what love is. Lord, you've called us your own out of darkness into your marvelous light. And for that we celebrate. And if there's someone here who hasn't come into the light, Lord, I just pray for them to look to you. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. I want to look at Nehemiah. And I will look at him one day. Because <laughs> he's where I want to be. And I think you want to be, right? In heaven around the throne. So, we're going to go through chapter 4, but I'm going to kind of talk about for a backdrop so we can catch up on this hero, Nehemiah, this one who was the cupbearer, this one who had a, a good job, I would say, right? He's in Chushan at the Citadel. He's got it going on. He's hanging out with the king, and he's testing his drink. And this was a pretty well-known thing that you would test the food and the drink so they couldn't get to the king. So now the king's pretty, pretty foolproof. And I don't even really think you got to worry about it because they're not going to try to poison the king this way. They're going to look for another way, right? Because they already know he's going to test it out. Unless they got something against Nehemiah, he doesn't really have anything to worry about. So he's just there in this vacation place, eating it up, being merry, but he has a heart. And if you look at chapter 1, you'll see his heart is a heart to ask. And he asked them there about the survivors who are left from the captivity in verse 3 of chapter 1. And finds out as he asked about them that they are in great distress. His response in verse 4 of Nehemiah 1 is that he mourned and he sat down and he, he wept. It kind of took the air out of, out of him, you know. He, he just kind of sat down and he also fasted and he prayed. And who he prayed to, the end of verse 4, was the God of of heaven. And then he remembered the truth that God had shared that verse 9 if you return to me and keep my commandments if you obey in verse 10 it says that your servants and your people that you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong arm 110 of Nehemiah boy doesn't that remind you who it's about your your your. And so as he's looking to the Lord there um he prayed that he might be able to get granted to go and help those in Jerusalem. And it came to pass, it says, in the month of Nisan. So we know from looking at the timing, it's four months later. So Nehemiah was a guy who knew how to wait and pray. Pray and wait. And wait and pray. And that time wasn't just time of wasting it was a time of investing in that prayer as he waited to hear the voice of the lord oh how often we can be those impatient who don't wait on the lord and don't also have that time of investing that time it says in ephesians 5 16 to redeem the time knowing the time is short and how can you do that and how can i do that quite practically well we usually have a bible right on us don't we now with our phones always on us. Sometimes maybe we never got in the habit of the paperback Bible, but boy, you have a Bible and you have a prayer list. You can usually get on a, your church's prayer list and you can start praying for people. Well, there's no need just to consider it a wasted time. Yeah, I know you're sitting at the MVD. Yeah, I know it seems like it's you're getting impatient. I mean, we are people that can tap on a microwave waiting for the popcorn to pop. So we've got impatience problems, some of us that are really hyperactive like that. And yet, and but you know what it is to wait sometimes. Well, if you're if you're married, you do. Oh boy, I thought I was still at the men's retreat. I, I, see, that goes over real good at the men's retreat. But um, anyways, so 
We have him here. He waited and he prayed. He invested that time. And then he, we see he has favor. That, that uh, there is a letter sent to Asaph by King Artaxerxes that he can go through the forest. That's in verse 8 of chapter 2. And then he finally, um, it, it, things are going that way. But we see that opposition is already mounting in chapter 2, verse 10. When Sembalat the Hornite and Tobiah the Ammonite officials heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. How dare someone seek out somebody else's well-being, especially God's people. Well, there's a lot of problems with Americans doing that today still, isn't there? And caring about God's people when there's 1,500 missiles flown in from Hamas. Well, nevertheless, the way he faces the opposition here is he still goes to Jerusalem. And he's there again waiting three days. And then he gets up at night. And that's... One of the quintessential books of leadership biblically is the book of Nehemiah. He's a great leader. He's just an average kind of Joe, but God does a great work in his life, and he is a great leader. There's many aspects to look at, and one of the aspects you see here is that as this is happening at night while everybody else is sleeping, he's up working. He's up strategizing. He's up seeking the Lord. And that happens. And we're called to be leaders, all of us as believers, in one way, shape, form, or another. If you're a parent, you're supposed to lead, right? If you're at your workplace, you're supposed, even as we're grafted into the vine, be the head and not the tail. We are called to lead. We're leading our neighborhood, leading any social groups we have. We, we are to, to lead and point to Christ. And he is a great leader here, but this is part of the call of the leader, is that sometimes you're going to not be sleeping when other people are. You're not going to be relaxing and kicking back and everything else when other people might have that luxury afforded to them. But he fires them up because he says, look at verse 18 of chapter 2, and I told them of the hand of my God which had been good upon me and also the king words that he had spoken to me. So they said, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. He's got it going on, doesn't he? He's got the king's favor, the king's resources, the king's permission, the king's letter, and he's got the people following enthusiastically. But again, a contrast in verse 19, Samballot, Tobiah, now we got Geshem adding in, and they're hearing of this, and they laughed at us and despised us and said, what is this thing you were doing? Will you rebel against the king? They had the motives all wrong. They're trying to stop, uh, start a, a fight and a discourse between Artaxerxes, and they are just in there stirring up trouble, being uh, just like the enemy who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. In chapter 3, you see counterclockwise, just geographically as a, as a smart builder, he, he's building the gates. The only thing that I want to point out in chapter 3 is verse 5, that the uh, Tekoites made repairs next to them, but their nobles did not put their shoulder to the work of the Lord. So I just wanted to point out those weak guys right there that didn't do what they were supposed to do, and they're recorded in history, and so don't do that because you don't want to be pointed out ever in the future as being the one that didn't put your shoulder to the work in a weak deal. So now we get to chapter 4, where we're going to go through all of the verses there and I like what it says there, and I don't like it. Because even as he's had that favor and he's got this stuff going on and everything else, it says, but it so happened. Does anyone know what but it so happened feels like? Well, everything was so going so great, but it so happened. There was opposition. Why do we get so surprised at opposition? I don't know. Because you look at the Bible and it's all through there. You know, hey, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, opposition much? Hey, Daniel, in the lion's den, how about you? Hey, hey, Ruth and Esther, have you had your share? Hey, Joseph, man, doing everything right. And sometimes we think we do everything right, everything's going to go right. But it is in God's plan and purpose as he works all things out for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. But here's the problem is that right now here on the temporary, on the horizontal, all we can see sometimes is the opposition coming against us. 
And there will be opposition coming against you. It is planned. We want to be faith-filled, but we don't but we also want to be stress-free. And I guarantee you, we need those opposition and those things to help build what God wants to build in us and to accomplish the work that he has planned for us to do. And for them, it was to build the wall. And he's got something for each one of us, each one of you to do in your life. You are his poema, it says in Ephesians, as though God is working in us it says we have good works to do. So when they see it, whether it's give a cup of cold water, it's so that what we do is we do it and God gives the glory for it, right? Let your works be done before men so that when they see him, they will glorify our Father who's in heaven. There's work to do. And he knows his job right here specifically. And he's, so it happened. They got to building. They got going. And Cymbalat heard that they were rebuilding the wall. Verse 1, chapter 4, that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. And so they're upset about something good happening. They got upset at Jesus, didn't they? Time and again. He, the paralytic, he gets, gets his friends take him. They go through all the work. They hear the voice of, of the meeting going on, and they know Jesus is in there. They hear the master's voice. They start digging through a roof and everything else, and they're digging through a roof, and they've been carrying their friend, and they lower him down on the pallet and everything else. He gets before Jesus, and as he's before Jesus, Jesus goes, my son, your sins are forgiven you. He's taking care of the most important thing, the eternal thing. But all those people that are around criticize and go, who is this that says that? That's easy to say. Anybody could say that. Who is this? Jesus knew their thoughts and their intents, that they were evil. And he said, so that you might know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Rise, take up your pallet and walk. And he gets up and he goes out and they're cheering and everything else. The friends, but others, as they look at the friends cheering with, with blood and dirt and uh, and their hands and under their nails from digging through that roof and sweat on their face and, and cheering because their friends got healed and his, his faith has been uh, recognized by the Lord. I mean, you can go through time and again where the guy's there with the, with the withered hand and they're going, oh, look, at he's going to heal him on the Sabbath. Wow, what a creep doing that on the Sabbath, Jesus is. Time and again, you can see it in Scripture. You see, oh, what? Lazarus got out of the grave? He, he, he freed him from his grave clothes? Right then, how are we going to kill this guy? So opposition, we should expect it. And we should not think just because we're doing the right thing that opposition's not going to come. And, he's, and it's mounting here. They're indignant. They're mocking. And he was before his brethren the army of samaria and said what are these feeble jews doing will they fortify themselves will they offer sacrifices will they complete it in a day will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish stones that are burned now tobiah the ammonite was beside him and he said whatever they build even if a fox goes up on it he will break it down the the stones of the of the wall now one of the things either as it's even as it said earlier there was laughing and there was mocking and there was despising of them that happened in chapter 2 verse 19 we see again combined with that is mockery paul said in first corinthians 2 11 that we are not ignorant of the devices of the enemy we should be smart about that second second corinthians 2 11 lest satan should take advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices one of the devices he uses is mockery, making fun of you. You've heard it, haven't you? Sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will never hurt you. And why are they telling you that? Because words are currently hurting you. <laughs> yeah, sticks and stones hurt physically, but words can hurt emotionally, mentally, can't they? It's they can build up and they can tear down. So the word's so important, and we tell that nursery rhyme in order to help facilitate some sort of comfort. But the reality is I think we're better off recognizing it and that of opposition and then dealing with it accordingly like Nehemiah does as he seeks the Lord in this. Um, this mockery that's happened, it's... 
it's really like fivefold here. So when he says there that what are these feeble Jews doing? Sambalat says, what are these feeble Jews? He, he's really mocking and ridiculing the workers, isn't he? And he's saying, will they fortify them, themselves? Now he's mocking the work. Are they ever going to, you know, do anything that's going to help keep them safe? We know what? Our God is our, our strong tower. Our God is our refuge. He is our fortress. But then he's like, what are they going to do? Will they offer sacrifice? This is a mockery of God. Will they have a place where they can have a temple and they can offer sacrifices and worship God? Will his Shekinah glory ever, you know, show up there again? There's a lot of inferences here that they have. Will they complete it in a day? No, this is a big job. They, they're not up to it. They don't have the stamina stamina or fortitude to carry on so what we see is they're never going to be able to do it in time they're going to give up before it's over when the, and now they even mock the materials for the work the, the stuff you got's no good it's just a bunch of burned up rubbish stones and then you got this other guy chiming in um, you got Tobiah who comes in here the Ammonite he's beside him and I just picture him like this little weasel cartoon, like, yeah, hey, yeah, 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 yeah. Even if a fox, even if a fox goes up in the wall, it's just gonna go down because it's no good. It's like, ah, oh, mockery, chicanery of it all. And, and you know what those walls have been like, right? You had them when you grew up in the neighborhoods sometimes, and you try to and you go, not that wall, it's, it's ready to come down. He goes, that's the best they could ever do, is that. So it's full on, fivefold mockery and they even make fun of what might be the finished work that it won't be any good what does nehemiah do to that kind of mockery he says here oh our god for we are despised turn their reproach on their own heads and give them as plunder to a land of captivity do not cover their iniquity and do not let their sin be blotted out from before you for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. Now, there's all kinds of prayers in the Bible. There's, you know, prayers of adoration, prayers of confession, prayers of thanksgiving, prayers of supplication. There's all kinds of different prayers. This is an imprecatory uh, prayer. This prayer is a prayer of divine justice. This prayer isn't really personal vengeance. We might think that, but as we look at this prayer, it's one where God's divine justice and the assault that it is on God, it's not a personal thing. Here, nearly to the degree that it is, God, you, you hear them. They're against your work. They're against your workers. They're against your will. They're praying in agreement. They're in trouble. You know, it's funny when one thing I wanted to make clear and remind our fellowship of when I first saw just rumors and mumblings of, of um, the fact that, that COVID was uh, approximately 1.2 billion times more spreadable if you sang by some experts. And I saw it coming and I said, hey, to the worship team, I sent them out the, these, a couple of these news articles. And they were like, because it, you know, it was a lot of, what are we doing? There's a lot of that going on and what's happening? And oh no, people, you know, you got different reactions from people you thought one way about. And so they got it from me and they were like, are, are we going to stop? Are you going to want us to stop singing? I just gave them the reports first. I kind of set them up from what people were saying. And then I go, oh no, we're not going to stop singing. I go, but I take, tell you, this is coming. This is coming, and it came in California, and that's the law in California right across. We are on the state line, right across the, the line. And I said, no. You know why? Because I got a verse, and that verse says, sing unto the Lord. So we're never going to stop singing. It says to worship the Lord. We're never going to stop worshiping. The reality is that it looked like for quite some time that the Jews were in a lot of trouble and the plagues are coming. And, and Pharaoh was just mean as, as can be. And he was a dictator and a ruler. And they got their own little Gavin Newsom uh, Pharaoh over there in California. 
But here, here's the reality. What I said, and I said, look, the people of God were not in trouble. Who was in trouble in those plague days? It was Pharaoh. So you need to pray for Pharaoh because he's in trouble with God. He tries to, why? Because they wouldn't let God's people go to worship. That's why Pharaoh was in trouble. If You can draw your own similarities there because I painted them pretty clearly, I believe. So he, he says, don't cover their inequity. And then he goes, and then he just gets back to work, verse 6. So we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined up together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. And again, it switches, verse 7. Now it happened when Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, and the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites, and all the uptight... Heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were being closed, that they became very angry. So their opposition is mounting. They, um, if you, you look at this, so you would have Symbalit from the north. You would have Tobiah and the Ammonites from the east. You would have the A Arabs from the south, and you would have the Ashdodites from the west. So it's all around. The pressure is coming the opposition from all around. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to God. There's 14 prayers you'll find in Nehemiah. And because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. So you have prayer and watch. New Testament hasn't inverted a lot of places. Watch and pray. It's a practical, it's a spiritual. It's accounting on the Lord, but it's doing what the Lord calls you to do. It's practical, it's spiritual. Watch. Keep your eyes open. Look out. The enemy is like a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. Watch, but pray. Pray that you enter not into temptation. Pray that you get delivered out of temptation. Watch and pray. Pray and watch. Practical, spiritual. Then Judah said, so Judah, it's not the original Judah guy, but uh, this Judah comes and he says, and there's always going to be people saying, <laughs> the strength of the labors is failing, and there is so much rubbish that we are not able to build the wall. So a few big things happen here, and I want you to notice when it happened. Remember just back a couple of verses? Halfway through, halfway through. You ever get discouraged, despondent, downcast, halfway through what God has called you to do? Maybe you're going, I got a long ways before maybe the Lord comes for me or before I go home to be with the Lord. And you might feel like giving up and quitting. Well, what's the point? What, you know, it seems like if things aren't going smooth. I thought, and maybe you got sold a lie from the prosperity doctrine that everything's going to go super smooth when you get saved. Now, when you first get saved, sometimes the Lord might put protection around you as a baby as he puts it, and things might just, like, fall into place. Everything you touch turns to gold. But I found as I walked with the Lord longer, sometimes what I touched turned to mold right away. And it just, and, it, and there was opposition, and there was problems, and there was turmoil, and everything else. But it caused me as a believer to seek the Lord's face even more, to get down on my knees even more, to have an expectancy even more of what he might do because it was beyond me and what I could ever do. And so their, their strength is gone in verse 10 there. Their vision is lost and their confidence is shattered. Those three things, strength, vision, and confidence, all in verse 10 is what's happening there. They're going, I can't even. I'm I'm done I don't know it's too much well these three things I want to tell you and I don't know where you're at these strengths are very recoverable in the Lord if you feel like you got no strength left you can't go another day if you feel like, you know, I don't know what I'm doing, why I'm going, what's the point in it, my, your vision is lost. And you're going, I'm surely not the one that could ever be called to accomplish this. And your confidence is shattered. Look to the Lord. 
Isaiah says, think about who he is. Have you not known? Reminds you this morning, fellowship. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, he neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth and his own strength shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So these things all recoverable as we look to the Lord. Now, the adversary in verse 11 says, They will neither know nor see anything till we come into their midst and kill them kill them dead dead as a doornail they're going to be super dead and cause the work to cease because you know what you can't build a brick wall when you're dead doesn't that sound juvenile <laughs> well when you do it that way right yeah i get it so it was when the Jews who dwelt near them, who were just listening to the lies of the enemy and the threats of the enemy and trying to be put into a place of fear from the enemy, near them came that they told us ten times. For whatever place you turn, they will be upon us. Because they remember north, south, east, and west. Whatever place they turn, they'll be upon us. 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 Ten times! Now, some of you moms know what ten times in a row sounds like. Mom, 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 But can you imagine? And it was a tactic. You know, when you look at what they was claimed about the potency, potency of coronavirus in the billions of news bites in the nothing had ever been put on social media on the the network media on the media to exasperate how huge they would try to blow up out of proportion the danger and I'm not denying the danger. There's danger all over. They asked 10,000 students on a survey, what, what would you do um, if it would, it would cost, you know, I, I think it was like, it was more than 10,000 on the survey, I think, but they, they asked them, what would you do if you were going to have to sacrifice 10,000 of your friends in the next year for convenience? and for the economy, would you accept that as acceptable? And a huge in the 90% said no. But what they didn't realize was that many died in car wrecks in that age group every year. But we've gotten used to that. We, we accept that kind of risk factor for the convenience. Almost all of us probably know someone who's been changed, maimed, or passed from a car accident. And it's horrible. And it does kind of freak you out for a little while. And you think about it a lot. But the reality is that fear is from the enemy. He has given us what does it tell us in 2 Timothy 1.7. He has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of a sound mind, clear thinking. Right? His perfect love does what? Casts out fear. So it's the opposite. His love trusting him he's in control he's on the throne and so they come and now the enemy's tactic is to try to use fear and as he tries to use fear it's something that he often uses and he'll repeat it to you you're gonna fail sometimes and you get so afraid to fail you know jesus said so many everything he said was revolutionary but some stick out to me and Matthew 10, 28 really sticks out. And do not fear those who kill the body and cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. All you have to do is we have to ask ourselves, let me see, that person who's trying to instill fear in me, do they have the capability, the capacity to do something after I die? 
The answer is always no, unless you're talking about God. And so who is the one we are to fear? The, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, the word tells us. We are to fear the Lord. And so as we consider that, what Jesus said, do you think, how do you think they reacted? It's just like going up to him. Hey, Jesus, some of these people want to kill us. <laughs> Don't fear those. All they can do is kill the body. Big whoop. <laughs> I am so scared. We'll try to instill fear. I don't know if you've ever been threatened to be killed or not, but I have on more than one occasion. There's been different threats. First one started really early. It was my brother. <laughs> I didn't really take it too sincerely, though. He couldn't stand the trouble he'd get in with dad and mom if he did that, right? He knew he wouldn't. It was just an idle threat. They don't sweat. They don't sweat the idle threats about things and get caught up in fear. Our lives are the Lord's. Our time is in his hands, the Bible says. You can't do nothing to us, the enemy, unless it goes through his hands and his plans and his purpose. When I caught COVID and my whole family caught COVID and it went through our church pretty, pretty good. Um, and I, I got pretty sick. And so I did... Uh, the only time I ever did that because I didn't want to throw it on somebody last minute it was right as we're getting into the Christmas season and I I came down with it probably a, almost a week before and then finally when uh, I opened up a garlic jar and tried to smell it and then air freshener I realized oh well that's good well, guess what I got and it was going around our family and then um, our sons one of our sons Girlfriend, you know, she went and got tested, she had it, and just everything else. Thanks for visiting from Florida, whatever. Um, <laughs> but it just was all through the place. But I, I went in there, and I, I said on the video, the only time I think we'll ever do that, but I did the teaching from a video because I was already preparing for it, but I told the fellowship, I go, hey, look, not every old fat guy dies from this <laughs> because that's what the fear was, was saying. But if I do, then it's the Lord's will. And tell you what, if I go home to be with the Lord, better to be with the Lord, the scripture tells me. I'm torn between the two. Better to stay for you. But I know this, that no matter what happens, come what may, no matter what, that whatever it is, that it will be a light and momentary affliction, though it might not like seem like it right at the present moment, but compared to the surpassing weight of glory we have with the Lord in heaven. So fear not, Jesus said, my little sheep, it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Time and again, the scripture says, don't fear. Why don't we fear? He says, because I'm with you. He says, don't fear, because he knows we can be fearful, and we have an issue with that. But he says, he reminds us, and I remind you, he is with you. And then we see here in verse 13, he gets back to work. Therefore, I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings, and I said, people according to their families with their swords and their spears and their bows. And I looked, and and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders, and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses, because your wives and your daughters need to live in those houses. Now, military genius happens all through this to talk about leadership. And one of the geniuses is knowing how God created us that he stationed them in the gates and everything else by their families. Because a family will fight with a family for the family like it won't fight for anything else or anyone else. And a man will fight for his wife and die quite willingly if he needs to. That's the positions that he put them in. Very, very wise there. And he, as he stands up here, I love it. He says, don't be afraid of them. And then he says, remember the Lord and all that the Lord is. See, he's a leader here. And leaders help others to quit flinching. My brother led me. 
one of the guys in different ways. Um, and he led me to quit flinching. You know how kids flinch and like kids like to make other kids flinch? And he'd do that and I'd flinch a little. And then when he, I would flinch, he would hit me. And then if I didn't flinch, he wouldn't hit me. And what's the worst that happened? I get hit. Get a little smack. Big deal. So like I said, I don't care if he does smack me or he doesn't smack me. I'm going to quit flinching. Too many flinch too much. I don't know who it's a word for, but the word for the day for some might be quit your flinching. <laughs> so these, are, these guys stop. They quit their flinching. What happens? Man, bullies and the enemy so often just, uh, you know, his teeth have been removed. So it, he just prowls and stuff. So, and it happened when our enemies heard it that it was known to us. Like, okay, well, you come on. That God brought their plot to nothing. It never happened. So they would have worried about something that never happened. And then all of us returned to the wall, everyone to his own work. So they get back to work. So it was from that time on that my servants, uh, that half of my servants worked at the construction while the other half held their spears and the shields and the bows. And they wore armor, it was practical, they were prepared, and the leaders uh, were behind the house of Judah. Those who built the wall and those who carried the burdens loaded themselves with one hand, and they worked the construction, with the other hand they held a weapon. Every one of the builders and the sword girded at his side as he built, and there was one who sounded the trumpet, and he was besides me. See, he made his prayer to God, and yet he was practical. Like looking for that job where you just don't say, well, I, made, I filled out an app. Well, did you follow up on it? No, but I've been praying. Did you go knock on doors? No, but I've been praying. Prayer and practicality. So he said to the nobles, verse 19, the rulers and the rest of the people, the work is great and extensive. He didn't sugarcoat it. And we are separated far from one another on the wall. Whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us here, our God will fight for us. He is, but our God will fight for us. The rec he's recognizing again the spiritual. It goes back and forth, practical and spiritual. Very practical. Have the family fight for each other. In the Six-Day War in 1973, when Egypt and Syria joined together with other Arab coalitions to destroy Israel, they made a big mistake. Because what they did was they attacked, they thought, his good on a holiday. But what it was, was it was Yom Kippur. And what happened, it only took one phone call in the neighborhoods and the families and everybody's gathered together for the, for the celebration of Yom Kippur. And they were like, on it. And against all odds, because God was with them, six-day war, you guys lost. The people against God lost. And in the end, we are the winners in Christ. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. So he says, rally to us here. God will fight for us. How great it is when the people of God have a rallying point and they will rally. When they'll, they're here and they'll be uh, there for others, whether they rally in prayer for someone who needs it. Whether they, we had one time in our church in 25 years where we, because of um, someone trusting me, someone who said something about some finances, went ahead and some construction stuff, and then the guy got mad. Rich people get mad more than poor people. That's something I've noticed. But anyways, he got mad. He wasn't getting his way. And he said, nope, forget it. And we had already, I'd already given my word, and we'd already poured all this cement. And so I had to say, you know, we were right in the middle of our building project that we, we've been paying on for quite a while. We were still paying rent at the old place. The uh, electric company comes in and switches our meter that we had to fight to get back and is charging us four times the amount of the for a kilowatt to the point of if we would have had it in the summer escalation we would have had a $7,000 a month electric bill we've got all these things we got to pay just couldn't do it and I just pray asked the church to pray and it wasn't one person coming through you know what it was it was the people in the church some of them probably $20 rallied together Boom, in two weeks, we paid off that construction need. Oh, when the people of God rally together because they hear the voice of God and they want to do the work of God, 
Oh, it's a great thing. So we labor, verse 21, in the work, and half of the men held the spears from daybreak until the stars appeared. And at the same time, I also said to the people, let each man and his servant stay at night in Jerusalem, that they be on guard by day and a working party by night. So neither I, my brother, and my servants, nor the men on the guard who followed me took off their clothes, except that everyone took them off for washing because they were stanky. Because <laughs> they were working hard. And so obviously that level of intensity can only be kept for a certain amount of time. But they kept it what was necessary for 52 days and boom, bam, the wall is built. Well, just to conclude here, that the Lord never told us it would be easy. What the word does tell us is to do all things heartily as unto the Lord. Whatever we do and we realize and we recognize it's to the Lord. And it's so true that um, if we're not doing it to the Lord, what's the point? Psalms tells us, unless the Lord builds a house, the builders build it in vain. Solomon built a lot of stuff. And he was doing it for his own need. And he got taken astray because what happened was the heart makes a convert of the mind. Though he was such had such wisdom that the Queen of Sheba would say, man, look at this. And Solomon arrayed in all of his splendor. But, and she goes, I haven't even heard the half of it, man. But his intelligent mind got taken astray by his wandering heart. Because the heart will make a convert of the mind. So, the heart needs to be guarded. And what Solomon said when he looked back and re regained consciousness, if you will, and got his heart right, he said, if, if it's under the sun, and he could only see 93 million miles out, I guess, he goes, not to heaven, not beyond that, not to an eternal God, an omnipotent God, an omniscient God. He said, it's all just vanity, if that's what we're doing it for. I don't care what you build, what you have, what you accomplish, what you attain. It's vanity if it's not is unto the Lord. So there's that great reminder in Ecclesiastes to remember the Lord. And I tell you this, the Lord, though you might go through the ups and the downs, when we first thought we were to plant in Parker, 45 miles south of Lake Havasu, we, uh, I went and got a, a post office box to start you know, going and doing business there and whatever else you need to do, the church junk. Um, and some lady shows up there that takes our, you know, that we get the post office box. She says, oh, you're coming here to do Calvary Chapel? I've been waiting for a Calvary Chapel. I look, it, it, I, I used to go to Calvary Chapel. You, I don't know how big that tent was in Calvary Chapel, but I tell you what, I think it's grown since it <laughs> hasn't been there. Because I got more people telling me they were at the tent. And I said, well, you were there one time, like the guy I ran into one time. And he goes, oh, Pastor, I go to your church. And I go, oh, well, yeah, Jesus the church that I pastor. And he goes, yeah. And I go, well, um, wh what, uh, uh, I, I go, oh, I don't recognize you. I'm sorry. And they go, yeah, I was there a year ago last Christmas. <laughs> That's not going to the church. That's not being part of the church. But so I don't know how many of those we got. But she tells me, you know, we just can't wait for Calvary. And then guess, guess what? She never showed up. She never showed up one time. That'll, that'll kind of bum you out and everything like that. But you know what? God used it because I'm going, okay, like, you're in this, Lord. Kept me going week, week. I'm looking for her sometimes. And when's that post office lady? <laughs> <laughs> but I know this. When the enemy comes in like a flood, God raises up a standard. And there's nothing that he can bring in opposition that can compare to what the Lord can do in us and through us. So expect opposition, but figure on divine help in all of your oppositions. Father, we just come before you and we thank you that we lift up our eyes and we know where our help comes from. The help comes from you, Father, the maker of heaven and earth and all that you do for us and all that you are out of your benevolence, Lord, who causes the rain to fall even on the unjust as well as the just. 
Lord. Help us to look to you. Inspire your people today to look to you so that they might finish through no matter what the opposition, even as you give us an example as our Alpha and Omega, as the one true and faithful witness that you who we are to fix our eyes upon, who for the joy that was set before you, you endured the shame of the cross. And you hated and despised the shame of it, but you endured, enabling you to be seated at the right hand of the Father. And we have the promise of being around your throne. Let that encourage us today, I pray in Jesus' name.